March 21st, 1967. Charlie had both dreaded and dreamed of this day. The day was finally here. This would mean that he would have to leave his familiar surroundings of the institution he had called home for the past six years. Charlie walked down the long, dark corridor of McNeil Island Penitentiary to freedom. I tried, he thought. I asked to stay. In front of him, the heavy metal doors loomed. The door slowly creaked open, and Charles Manson stepped out into the humid air of the 1967 Summer of Love and made his way down to San Francisco. It was in this environment of cultural revolution that Charlie started his family. All right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to our first ever cultish true crime series. This is the continuation of our series. We are, this is our third episode into this whole uh, journey into uh, the mind of Manson. Uh, We are focusing in on uh, really the formulation of Charlie, uh, Charles Manson's, what is known as the Manson family, uh, the environment, uh, the summer of love, and all that took place from 1967 to 1969. So much took place within two years. We're going to try and get that in two episodes. We're going to try. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, as always, Andrew, uh, do we give you a name for the? Or do we give you a true crime name? You're the super sleuth, but I thought we gave you. A, did we give you a I special? Mean, that team really, name? that is a totally a true crime yeah. name. Yeah, we'll keep yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, we'll keep you super sleuth. Armchair You're, detective, super yes, sleuth. There you we are. Go. You are. <laughs> you are one of the te- detectives on call, uh, figuring out all the different mysteries and intricacies of this crime that has fascinated. Really, Ameri- is part of American culture. It's wild. I was just thinking about this. It's captivated. Captivated. In the era of Manson, he would like to hold people captive. Yeah. Ooh, and, he, and here well we said, are. Well said. 2020 in the craziest uh, year that I've known, mm. pretty yeah, much. Uh, we've, we've got we got pandemics. We've got murder hornets and all the racial tension. There's so many similarities, <laughs> especially what we're going to kind of delve into. Right. So, mm. uh, as always, we have... Uh, Dr. Robin Hall. Hi. With you. And we actually gave you a name. We call you Mine, the Mine Hunter. Yes, I love yes. that. So I, it's I almost, will wear I, that with pride. Yes. It's almost like a fighter name, like Robin, Mine Hunter, <laughs> Hall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yes. So um, as we discussed before, uh, you have your doctorate is in clinical psychology. Your primary focus is really trauma. That's right. Yes. And you have a huge interest and fascination, just as a whole, almost a recreational, but it's a fascination too with true crime and a lot of people do yeah um and so just real quickly i mean you maybe talked about is about this when it comes just to true crime in general because this is our first time delving into it and there's tons of podcasts out there right what's your fascination about it yourself and why do you think like true crime really is a pop is almost a culture in and of itself yeah I think uh, let's so. talk about that just real quickly and then we'll jump into this environment of manson well i i think you're absolutely right and i think my fascination with it is probably um, akin to most people's fascination with it, uh, just the total depravity of human nature. Mm. It's like a train wreck that you can't really pull your eyes from. And I mm. love the psychology behind it, you know, figuring out what drives people, what motivates people to um, participate uh, and and act in the ways that they do. And when you get individuals like Manson who were so good at understanding the psychology of others and manipulating that psychology for somebody like me it's just utterly fascinating Mm. Um, and then the the fallout of that I think we see we see a lot of God's common grace and we don't recognize that and then Mm -hmm. when we look at somebody like Manson you you really do see the juxtaposition of yeah this is God restraining people and Mm. this is what it looks like when he doesn't right um for me that you know that's really the fascination of that i have with true crime um and you know we were talking earlier um i I mean jesus being convicted tried and convicted as guilty is really the ultimate true crime story Mm. um you know for so for people even though like you know non-believing people wouldn't identify their fascination as you know looking at total depravity or use those words but right. really we're all drawn to it for that reason i think mm. we, we see ourselves in it yes um and uh you know it's fascinating you know like i've even asked myself the question you know oh my goodness you know like what, <laughs> what would it take for me to get there you know right. and not that i imagine myself as manson but um it is it's like a train wreck you can't really pull mm-hmm. your eyes from it mm. yeah 
Yeah, definitely. And so, yeah, I, I would definitely agree. I, I think that one of the things, too, is that when you look at just the fascination, I think that people like people have uh, we're creating i would say from a christian standpoint obviously that's how we view it with our podcast is based on that's the only really way you can give a true accounting for making sense of the world that it's only through uh, understanding a total depravity or the fact that sin that we live in a sinful and fallen world where you can give an accounting where true crime makes sense right so when you look at someone like whether it's charles manson or ted bundy or almost even you go because i was thinking about this the other day too that Cult with cultish, which primarily deal with cults, they there's celebrity leaders like Jim Jones, uh, David Koresh, kind of these celebrity names, and even true crime kind of has a celebrity too, like Ted Bundy. Um, like, what are some other popular names too? Um, John too? Wayne Gacy. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, oh my gosh, I'm gonna Jeffrey through. Dahmer. Oh yeah, Jeffrey Dahmer. Um, uh, the Whitechapel Killer, whose name is gonna completely escape me at the moment. Yeah. Um, they're they're really fa- really famous people. When you think of like horrific crimes, there are certain images, faces that pop yes. to mind. Um, and that's you know that's really interesting from a psychological standpoint because you hear narcissism. Yeah. And what you know what drives that is this like really at the bottom of this kind of grandiose sense of self is mm-hmm. an ego to use a secular psychology term that's just not there right um so you've got somebody like charles manson who grew up in a situation where um, he was unwanted by really everybody in his blood family so he decided to go out and create his own and to make himself the leader Mm -hmm. to feel important and um you see a lot of comment like btk um dennis Rader, the the btk killer bind torture kill Mm -hmm. um he wanted credit for what mm. he did what you know after he was caught um and it really was his arrogance that got him caught he was uh, talking with one of the detectives they were communicating with him through the newspaper right. um and the, de- the lead detective on the case convinced him that uh he could send in a floppy disk drive and they would have no way of tracing it back to who it was <laughs> um which was of course inaccurate and that's mm. how he was caught so as soon as he was caught and they started interrogating him he really didn't falter at all. He immediately confessed and he mm-hmm. wanted credit for everything he had done. And you wow. see that a lot with serial killers. Mm-hmm. Um, they want credit for their crimes. And if you kind of tie that back into ego, if you've got somebody that really underneath all that like superficial arrogance believes that they're worthless, mm-hmm. they don't understand they're made in the image of God, truly. Right. Um why wouldn't they, you know, they want to be famous. They want mm-hmm. to be loved. They want to be adored. And even if that's going to be through this really infamous way, right. it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Okay. No, that's wow. really good. So let's just, let's just jump into the story of Manson. We, we've got a good foundation and this is uh, definitely so much to unpack here. So the first thing that fascinated me, I want to get your take on this and Andrew, you can give me your take too, is that I was thinking about this. So Charlie spent a good amount of time prior to 1967 just being in prison. Yeah. Really, in a sense, like, you, know, you talk about cults, how they isolate people from the outside world. Uh, Charlie experienced that at, at expense of he experienced that at expense of the state. Right. So you ma- so imagine right now it's 2020. We had so many crazy things right now. So imagine you go to prison. Say you just get a year sentence, and it, it's a 2019. Say June, you get a six and a half month month sentence or and, well, not six and a half months let's just say you get out around this time like a year sentence and so you get out around this time and you're here and all of a sudden you see people wearing face masks everywhere the you news there's riots you know there's riots going back and forth things are on fire there's things in the news about murder hornets <laughs> and, and and just up and up, up people and you're thinking well, what what happened right but just real quickly, but going back to Charles Manson, and if you listen, you guys haven't listened to the first two episodes, we talked a lot about his upbringing and what happened during his prison. So what do you think the aspect of just being in prison for a long extended amount of time, being in prison, and all of a sudden being thrown out of prison when he wanted to stay there, sure. but then going into an environment like 1967, the summer of love, of this real time of cultural revolution, because right. all these different things were going back and forth. What do you think, how do you think that affected the psyche of Manson, just the isolation for that extended mm. period of time, given all the troubles that he had prior to that? Right. So I think like isolation away from the culture is one thing, but he wasn't isolated within the context of prison, right? right? Um, you know, and Andrew, you and I were talking about this. Mm-hmm. Um he he really he, he didn't want to be paroled. He actually asked the parole board to let him remain in prison. Yeah. Um. And you know I think people want to believe that that's because you know deep down he had this empathetic understanding of the true monster that he was, and if he was released, then 
if he wasn't released, then maybe he wouldn't go on to become this monster. But I think in truth, what what was really going on is that he had become very, very good at manipulating the people around him. Mm. Um, he knew the environment he was in. He knew the people that he was working with, um, you know, the other inmates, the, the clinical staff, you know, prison staff. Um, and he flourished there. I mean, by all accounts, that, that's why he was paroled. You know, yeah. he was the model inmate, model prisoner. Um, and he had made, you know, progress, quote unquote. So um, why would you want to leave an environment that you mm-hmm. understand so well? Right. Um, you know, it's really quite scary if you think about leaving this, this very familiar place that he's kind of got all of his ducks in a row and he he doesn't have to work so hard because he mm. knows the psychology of the people there mm. the way the system works and now he's he's coming into this brand new world um and you know outside of newspapers you know he wouldn't really have known what was mm. going on um so i think it's important too that you know just like now we've got this huge cultural revolution going on you know oh, yeah. in 2020 um there was this huge cultural revolution going on in the 60s mm-hmm. you know we were moving away from uh, family driven uh, households um, you know people were preaching you know sex drugs and rock and roll um, which was new mm-hmm. you know essentially um, and I'm well, we're, we're going to talk a little bit later about um, Dennis Wilson and the Beach Boys and kind of yeah. you know his connection with Manson and the you know internal evolution he was going mm-hmm. through um, and why that really made Manson what he was preaching yeah. so interesting to Dennis. Um, but for Charlie, any environment that he would have come into was going to be new, mm-hmm. right? So he, yeah. he, in the same way that he learned to be adaptive in prison, mm-hmm. he saw this revolution occurring and he capitalized on it. That's yeah. it right there. Yeah. Like imagine coming out of prison you're there for six years right and the society that you have been that that you had been formed to is a society that's changing so fast so once he gets out he goes well where do i want to go do i want to go to let's say i'm just gonna use texas as an example where everyone's super conservative Mm -hmm. the opposite of how he is and how he grew up or am i going to go to hate ashbury where people are accepting uh these these thoughts and this Mm -hmm. type of culture that i've kind of already been living for this time, I'm the master. Right. Yeah. The master's gonna go to hate Ashbury now, and I'm gonna go ahead and, you know, yeah. create my, dom- mm-hmm. you know, my domain. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, a couple things too, just we mentioned the summer of love. There are a couple of things culturally that kind of really formulated the hotbed of that environment. It was, like I said, we were talking about the song, Are You Going? It's, uh, the song, the infamous song, a ballad of San. Are you going to San Francisco? The infamous ballad, and I'm not <laughs> going to try and say the lyrics. I'm not going to try and sing it because I'm neither a lyricist nor nor a singer. But that was just an example. You had really influential artists around that time. Just I watched a documentary. It's really good called uh, Charlie uh, Charles Manson Music from an Unsound Mind. It's on free on Amazon Prime. It's really good. So there you go, Amazon. You got a plug <laughs> All right there. Check out the documentary. It's really really Amazon. intriguing. But you had people not only like Dennis Wilson from the Beach Boys, but you had people like Neil Young, Janis Joplin, Jefferson airplane like the really infamous some of the most infamous people in music history some of the biggest influencers it was all this time around the summer of love i think one of the one of the real pinpoints that was a couple years prior when john f kennedy was assassinated Mm -hmm. because what you that was kind of the one of the turning points where people won people really did not trust their government as far as the official story goes right that's a whole nother episode in yeah. itself, but that was a real pinpoint where that not only that affected the culture, but also affected how people felt about the Vietnam War. And so that so you had the Vietnam War going on, you mm-hmm. had the assassination of John F. Kennedy, yep. which is one of the pinnacle turning points. Because prior to that, uh, the American culture really kind of had this very tinsel town Saturday evening post Norm Rockwell right. sort of feel to it, and this was the glass uh, that went. What do you call it? the glass ceiling being shattered as far as the, the JFK assassination, mm-hmm. and then and obviously in the middle of this period from 1967 1969, you you had the assassination too of Martin Luther King Jr. Right. Yeah. So you had that, and that's and so you had all these different things going on. But I think the pinnacle point of the summer of love started primarily when JFK was assassinated. And then sure. you had all this point where people were trying to delve and find meaning. Um, and so, you, go, go ahead with your well, you, know, you, you really have this I, this innocence lost kind yes. of concept, right? So you move out of, you know, the, the home, the, you know, where, where mom stays home and raises kids, dad, kids, dad goes to work, to we don't, we don't, as a culture, need to abide by that structure. The nuclear mm-hmm. family. Yeah, yeah, the nuclear family, right? So, um, 
JFK is assassinated, the Vietnam people start really questioning what business we have in Vietnam. Right. Um, so that that trust, that kind of um, that inherent trust people were giving to their leadership and their government wasn't there anymore. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, they felt like they couldn't trust what what mm-hmm. they were being told, and you see this. Um, really just running away mm. from those traditional uh, what, what really are like biblical views you know of the right. structure of the family um and culture towards i mean anything else you mm. know the idealization of it doesn't matter if, you know free love free freed with freedom with your body um right ex you know experimentation with drugs and uh, i mean a lot of drugs really psychedelic drugs and we'll talk about that a lot yes. today because it was a huge part of what manson used to manipulate his followers um but I think that the the point is is this innocence lost, and mm-hmm. and Manson never had that innocence, right? Um, so he knew that world, and I think that's why Hate Ashbury really appealed to him, like what you were saying, Andrew. So why why would I go to Texas when I could yeah. go to kind of the you know mm-hmm. the epicenter of this revolution that I'm as far as I'm concerned as Manson, I'm already living in exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so one of the things that always fascinated me too. So in Hey Ashbury, when he is there, I one of the things that Charlie did is that you know as much time as he spent in prison, he wasn't he didn't he didn't just he got he got very familiar with his environment. His his strength was manipulating people. But it's almost if you think about there's a, my one of my favorite books, Sun Tzu: The Art of War, when it talks about knowing your enemy, knowing the battlefield. Right. So one of the things he did when Charlie, because he said he got out of prison and he worked his way down to San Francisco is that he spent a good amount of time just walking around and just observing his environment. The whole place was a hotbed of colds. I watched one or two documentaries uh, on the summer of love and just the footage you see, you see like Hare Krishna's, you see all sorts of people that look like some sort of Celtic Druid on one corner. You see a bunch of uh, scantily clad hippies on one corner trying to propagate this so you just see all these different uh, religious uh, groups and you have all these different people trying to say hey our way is the truth kind of do this sort of thing uh, almost in a way way kind of it would pr- almost I mean maybe what the apostle Paul did mm-hmm. when he walked into a place like Ephesus sure where you have this whole bri- uh, broad variety of paganism so but here it is Charlie he's going around and just observing looking around seeing what makes people tick right and so one of the things that he really became aware of was LSD. Right. Which is interesting enough because, I mean, we talked about current environment and env- things going on today when it comes, especially now with 2020 and, and current events with racial tensions. But one of the big things that really has taken a huge resurgence is the interest in psychedelics. Um, and from a spirit, we've talked a couple of times that when it goes to the UFO phenomena, but it's also, I think, just culturally, it's making a huge comeback. Yeah. Um, as far as far as doing that, and especially, you know, you, you work in clinical psychology. So that's one of the things that Charlie got familiar with and understood the power of LSD. This is a huge part of the culture in the 70s. But talk to us real quickly just about so people understand from a psychological standpoint what these psychedelics do to the person. Sure. Why would that be appealing to someone like Charles Manson, knowing his love and ability to manipulate because that's where his strength was? Absolutely. So um, LSD... Um, uh, lysergic acid diethylthalamide is the, what the abbreviation stands for. Mm. Um, so it's a it's a psychedelic drug. It's a hallucinogenic drug. Um, and actually, you know, just to touch on what you were saying, Jerry, um, we're using it in research right now um, to treat wow. post traumatic stress disorder, depression, anxiety, and the research actually has some very interesting results. Um, mm-hmm. There's some promising results, um, and I think the results are promising um, for the same reason we're going to talk about right. <laughs> Right now, um, why Charlie Charlie thought you know saw what they could be used for and then use them. So one of the things that happens when you are under the influence of a psychedelic drug is you become extremely suggestible. Mm. So your environment is manipulated by essentially the poison because that's what you're taking is poison. Mm-hmm. Um, it's what causes the hallucinations. So you can have visual hallucinations, auditory hallucinations, um, tactile hallucinations. Um, so you know feeling things on your skin. Um, you could even have gustatory hallucinations so you can smell things that aren't there. 
Mm -hmm. Um, So when you're in that state, you become extremely suggestible. Mm -hmm. So somebody who's already really good at manipulating people who aren't under the influence is going to see a substance like this and what it does in terms of making people people vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And oh, yeah, I mean, this is magic, you know. Um, So and as we talk a little bit more about what Charles Charlie Manson's like specific ideas were, you know, his whole helter skelter Mm -hmm. and really what his, you know, quote unquote theology was, um, you'll see that it would probably take being under the influence of a psychedelic to believe some of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So um, he experimented himself, um, but also um, we'll see too, when he used psychedelics like LSD with his followers, a lot of the time he wasn't ingesting the substance. He was Mm -hmm. just doling it out. He Um, dished it out. Mm -hmm. Right. Making sure they take it. Which right. happens a lot of times in the world of cults where usually the leader will propagate an ideology to which he will, uh, which, which they're, he'll tell the followers to do one thing, but then they don't follow through with it. Right. Right. So like Osama bin Laden, for example, he would tell his followers, you need know, to blow yourselves up, mm. commit jihad, and you'll go and have 72 virgins. But <laughs> why didn't he lead the charge in that? He had everyone else do it for him, even though it was this wonderful and glorious thing. Right. You know, so you just, but that's just one extreme example, but you always see it all the time where it's, so it's always, you do, do as I say, not, not as, as I do, n- not as I do. Right. Ooh. There's something I think that's really important before we uh, move on. It's like, what's, what was the spiritual climate Ooh. of people then? Right. Mm-hmm. So I like the term that you use when you're referring to LSD, you said the term magic. Mm. All right. So, so here, here's Walter Martin. This is a quote in regards to the countercultural movement, the sexual revolution. He says, Referring to the people of the countercultural movement, he says they're tired of everything having to be examined by the empirical method and of all the truth and validity being placed in one category. They're looking for something outside for reality, and they are revolting against that system. There's a rebellion, secondly, against materialism in an affluent society which has given us so much. The young people of our day have turned to drugs and they have turned to alcohol and they have turned to sex and they have turned to rebellion in multiple forms. For what reason? Because they are turning off the affluency of a society which has so much, so little concern for many. What are they going to turn to? Some kind of reality to fill the vacuum of the soul? And Satan stands ready to supply that reality. Mm -hmm. That's the spiritual climate of the time during the sexual revolution. Uh, so and just to, to kind of expand on that, if if you are under the influence of a drug that causes the walls to breathe, mm. um, you, you know, you've got uh, marble tiling swimming, um, mm. you know, it, it, you become very open to the suggestions of somebody that might be more magical, you know, mm. magically oriented. So it's less difficult for you to believe that. And we'll talk about this again in detail. But. Manson believed that um, during Helter Skelter, they were going to travel to the center of the earth. That's where they were going to hide out until everything was over. Um, that becomes a lot more believable when the walls are breathing around mm. you, right? So yeah. um, it 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 was just a really a perfect kind of um, mechanism yeah. for him to use to suggest some of this more fantastical mm-hmm. stuff. Right. So again, people are trying to, to have this escape to this utopia. Right. They are one. It was so San Francisco wasn't enough. They then had to ingest LSD while they're in San Francisco. So one thing, Andrew, uh, you, men- you mentioned, and in the documentary mentioned this too, and I watched it, is uh, Timothy Leary. Yeah. You uh, just you, you kind of introduced me to him because when you're doing your research, uh, he had his very infamous saying, mm-hmm. and just tell me a little about his his thoughts and what sort of influence, uh, influence did he have? Oh, wow. Okay, so I'll, I'll try to make it. Uh, fairly brief, but um, Timothy Leary was a Harvard um, psychology prof- professor. Yes. And he and uh, I forget who the other person that worked with him, I don't have it pulled up right now, but they pioneered the way in LSD research that they were getting, you know, funding through the education system to provide for that. And he actually spoke um, at Golden Gate Park in San Francisco and he, he phrased the famous words turn on, tune in, and drop out. Mm-hmm. And so he spoke to all of these hippies essentially. And he gave that phrase Mm -hmm. and I I don't mean to be derogatory when I say hippies, I'm just, you Mm. know, just describing the people of that time. Yeah. But so what we, what we can see is not only was this countercultural movement, uh, supplied by like de facto, like resurgence, uh, also we have an education system that was also breathing in to this cultural environment and i mean if we look at nowadays it's it's very similar in regards to critical race theory intersectionality you name it Mm. breathing into the culture also the church nowadays but 
you know, fueling the atmosphere for rebellion. Mm -hmm. Um, But Timothy Leary many times also said he wasn't necessarily trying to create this revolution, but he is one of the main figures. Him and Richard Alpert, Alpert, who is uh, later known as Ram Dass, who was a guru. Yeah. um, They were really the two main educational proponents to LSD Mm -hmm. research in the United States of America, who also did influence the countercultural movement Mm -hmm. where it's turn on. So listen to what's going on in reality. So tune in and then drop out of it. Mm -hmm. Go do your own thing. Go search for this other metaphysical type of knowledge somewhere else. Go to your happy place. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And one of the things too, so what you'll notice too, if you listen to the second episode, we were talking, uh, we spent a good amount of time talking about Charlie's time in prison. And as we noticed, there's lots of different influences that he uh, sort of dealt, he kind of grabbed from every little aspect of it. And so there is a book that he, this one, I think it was a science fiction book or just, and, but also it was like Scientology mm. and all these other different uh, things he would just sort of grab from and put together. And so what happened in prison, I am sort of grabbing from everything that also in the inside prison began to manifest on the outside of prison in hate Asbury, all these different gurus. Like I said, he's watching all these different gurus. He's trying to say, okay, what works, what sticks, what doesn't, how can I kind of grab and put all these things together? Now I have LSD, which everyone's taking anyways. I can figure out a way to weaponize. Now I can weaponize this right. to manipulate that. So it's almost sort of like I've got an expansion pack to my manipulation ability. <laughs> oh, I love that. Right? Yeah. <laughs> that's, right. that's the gamer nerd part of me. Right, the frosting yeah. to it. Yes. It's and it, So you've got people like Timothy Leary who, you know, by all accounts is – this extremely respected brilliant prof- i mean professor of psychology mm-hmm. he is a psychologist he's you know he's part of this psilocybin project in the early 60s so it's not it's not he's not a government official he's not somebody in authority paid to be touting one way or the other he's an academic and people put their faith in that exactly. right um he's our, he's seen as this kind of unbiased authority figure because of that mm. um and i'm he's, i'm he's, reading here richard okay. nixon once described leary as the most dangerous man in america and he actually, um, there was, when we get into the tri- Manson's trial, uh, the Mans- Manson and the girls tried to have, we have tried to have their trial declared a mistrial because of what Rich- Richard Nixon commented about, about I Charlie. I remember hearing about that. Yeah. Um, Leary sounds like someone who would be on the Joe Rogan experience. Oh, for oh, sure. Easily. <laughs> easily. <laughs> easily. Yeah. I'm pretty sure he He's died like, before Joe Rogan started doing his podcast or he probably would be. Yeah. 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 yeah Joe Rogan, like, like, introduce, ladies and gentlemen, the great and powerful. Timothy Leary. Right. Well, so and in yeah. psychology, the whole idea behind <laughs> using psych- uh, things like a hallucinogen, and right. again, you know, like I said, we're we're using this right now in research. Right. Um, if I can escape my reality, so if I'm a combat veteran who has post traumatic stress disorder, um, my everyday reality is really hellacious. Um, Mm-hmm. You know, the post-traumatic stress is no joke at all. Right. Um, you've got people who are in kind of a chronic state of hyper anxiety. Um, and if my reality is that to every waking moment, why would I want to stay in it? Mm-hmm. You know, and so when you introduce something like a psych, you know, a psychedelic that allows me in a very real metaphysical way to escape that reality mm-hmm. and create my own Right. Right. Um, Especially with a controlled dose, which, you know, the people that are researching this aren't, you know, just eating paper of LSD in the way that somebody in Haight-Ashbury would have done it. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, in a really controlled environment, it allows me to escape. Mm -hmm. Right. And it allows me to make sense in this other reality, you know, what's going on. Um, And so that's the same idea that Manson is using to manipulate his his followers. Right. So we got the spiritual climate, the cultural climate, and then we have the LSD that Manson has weaponized. So with everything going on, one of the things that was very interesting is that during this time that you had roughly about 300 kids a day just just arriving in Haight Ashbury, just right. trying to find their way. So, and all of them were kind of in that point of really a vulnerable and susceptible. They're trying to find purpose and meaning and, and things like that. And one of the things I mentioned too is that uh, it was, I mean, the Manson family is very popular because of everything that happened. But for every person that's named, who knows how many unnamed people in mm. Haight Ashbury were completely uh, sucked into the world of the cults. There were so many uh, different uh, groups. Like I said, there's Hare Krishnas, mm-hmm. there's all sorts of different, gu- there's a guru in every corner. Well, those, those, those are the guys of. that were the, like, they would have the flowers, right? In the airport? Were those yes. the Hare Krishna? Okay. Yeah. Like when, when a society wants to reject materialism, 
that's where gurus thrive. Because if you think about Hinduism right. and many cults that come off of that, it's all about okay. overcoming the material right. you know, into a more spiritual, okay. spiritual sense of reality. So right. let's talk about the formulation of the family. So sure. at this time, uh, there's some famous names that now are kind of part of this whole story. They delve onto San Francisco and they get in connection with Charlie. So let's talk about a couple of them. People like Susan Atkins, sure, uh, Mary Bruner, people like that. Let, let's just talk about a couple of those people and just real briefly so people can kind of get an idea of what it was like. We don't just name every single person, sure, but just get an idea of some of the big players, how they get into Manson, what was kind of Manson's role with a partic- each particular person. Sure. So the five original female family members were Susan Sadie Mae Atkins, Lynette Squeaky from Patricia. Katie Krenwinkel, Mary Bruner, and Ella Jo Bailey. Mm. Um, so here, let me pull up my notes on um, each one of them. So we see a really common thread with these girls, and I think that's pretty important. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see. We can talk about Susan Atkins first. Um, she, you know, there were a few people that were kind of at the front of, of the trials. Mm -hmm. Um, so we, you know, we associate these, you know, the very famous pictures of the three girls arm in arm walking into the courtroom after Manson, you know, etches on his forehead, the, the other, the girls do the same thing in Mm -hmm. solidarity with him. Um, man, it's just cultish all the way, right? Yes. It really is. Um, okay. So let's see. So Leslie Van Houten. That's a name that you hear all the time mm-hmm. associated with um, the Manson family. So she became associated with the Manson family at 19. She was a high school dropout and a runaway. Um, so this is the kind of theme that we're going to see happen here. Yeah. Um, Patricia Krenwinkel. Well, while you're pulling that up too, sure. like one of the other people that come into the family later on, even though she wasn't directly involved in the murders, I skimmed through her book as Diane Lake. Mm-hmm. And she got into the Manson family when she was at 14 years old. And she was, and so she got caught up into it and both of her, she wasn't a runaway, but her parents, while you pull it up, her, her parents got involved in the whole hippie movement and, and taking LSD together and, and saw them kind of go their own way. But they joined, her parents joined this comp free love commune, which is very interesting because she talks about in her book, how this commune was all about free love and going against society and not being bound by the rules and love the one you're with, even though, you know, that infamous song, even though it came out in 1970, it still was prominent, kind of a commentary in the culture there. Mm -hmm. But so they were saying you could just basically, you know, sleep around, have sex with whoever you want, because this is the culture rebel against system. Don't be told what to do. And however, she got kicked out of the commune because she's 14 years old. So because she wasn't legal. Right. So for her, in her mindset, she was saying, this doesn't make any sense because here this culture is telling me free love, free love, don't listen to what society tells them, but then they kick her out based off of a construct that the society tells her, which goes to show if you don't have a ultimate foundation of truth, right. you end up, that worldview ends up collapsing on itself. But So she got kicked out of that group, but was really into LSD, psychedelics, trying to find meaning. So she became runaway. Sure enough, she didn't initially fall into Manson, but she got a hold. It was some of these people that we're going to mention that she got into contact with, which is how she joined the family at 14 years old. I mean, so it's what's amazing is Manson identifies these types of women, right, Um, and then trains them to identify girls and women that are very, very like themselves, Mm. right? So um, it... I mean, and you think you see that all the time in in cults and cult leadership, right? It's this uh, delegating of you know finding finding people. So if I can train my followers to identify people that would be good fits for the family, then I don't have to go out and do all the work, right? Wow. Um, so Patricia Krenwinkel um, met Manson in 1967, and she left uh, Los Angeles to go to San Francisco with him. She went by Katie. Um, she was picked up by Dennis Wilson of the Beach Boys um, and later uh, was part of you know, turning his house into like, kind of the flop, the Manson family flop house. So we'll talk more about that. <laughs> um, let's see. We've got Squeaky Fromm. Uh, her real name was Lynette. Um, if you look, uh, she was played by uh, Dakota Fanning in uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Yeah. 
Um, she wasn't a participant in either of the murders, but she was uh, a huge Manson follower and part of um, – at uh, Spawn Ranch, kind of running things at Spawn Ranch. Um, so, but we're talking about girls who have no like family structure, mm-hmm. or they leave their family structure, right? Um, and they essentially adopt Manson, or Manson Manson adopts them um, as the father figure, or as the the daughter, this really warped daughter kind of right. relationship. Um, so, part of becoming the fam a member of the family was you had to have sex with Manson and you had to have sex with each other. So that was a th- this breaking down of any kind of physical barriers that would exist yeah. between. Um, and, you know, as much as we don't want to believe this, mm-hmm. um, sex is an incredibly manip- can be very manipulative. Mm. Right. So, um, you know, and as much as we want to believe like, our, our culture tells us that it's no big deal and it doesn't matter. And it's, you mm-hmm. know, there's really no emotional connection to it, especially for women. That is so false. It's oh, so yeah. inaccurate. It's a spiritual there's a spiritual connection that absolutely when sex with somebody you're in your most vulnerable position um and so you've got this man who is becoming what they need right mm-hmm. that father figure that they need um and so uh, andrew and i were talking about this too one of the things that he did was he identified girls that weren't necessarily traditionally beautiful right so there mm-hmm. was a lot of self-esteem issues there um women that like himself were looking to belong right yeah. it, you, you you're able to identify those things in your that, that you are mm-hmm. unhappy with in yourself and other people right yeah. really fast Ooh. yeah and what what just uh, real quick you got i'm just going to comment on something too and one of the things you'll see parallel with this is that one of the biggest things one of the biggest uh, things people are aware of right now is this the horror and reality of sex trafficking right yeah, um, and we always talk about human trafficking but in a weird way we, we always think of charles manson as far as you know the murders that took place at Ciela drive but there's a lot of examples too of what happens between the trafficker and the people who end up becoming the victim there's a lot of manipulation there's a lot of drug use you mentioned before mm-hmm. one of the things that happens when uh, someone gets kidnapped who's going to be a trafficker they get them hooked on heroin right to be dependent on that so so you see that but really what you're seeing here when charlie is doing all these things getting them hooked on drugs and telling him them that you're you're wonderful you're beautiful and diane lake talks about that you know and Again, this is just the reality of this is a sinful, broken, fallen world as as just to quote, the world is rated R. Mm. A girl who's fourteen, there's a lot going on. Right. As far as her as far as her development goes, and being caught up in a cult like that, and then being told who's a lot of different insecurities and having Manson coming along to try and groom her insecurities and make her depend on that. That's just the reality of the uh, and of wow. really the, the wickedness of, right. of who he was and how he manipulate people. But ultimately, what you're seeing here is what this is typical cult mentality. Is this? It's the destructions of one's own personal identity and the replacement of it with something else. So mm. when someone's going in and having sex with Charlie and then taking the LSD and getting taught this warped ideology and having to do everything else, that is really the destruction of the old self. And the embracement of the new, as Charlie right. calls it. Well, and these new identities where, so like, I'm this, my old self that's destructed is this meek, vulnerable little girl who doesn't, doesn't have anybody that cares about them, um, has no worth, and it's being replaced by this image that Charlie's given me. Mm, right. This, I'm worthy, right? I'm worthy of attention. I'm worthy of affection. Um, I've been chosen specifically, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, we know, and in, in Paul says in Romans, you know, there are none that seek for God, right? Right. right? But because we all know God, because his law is written on our heart, we're, we are aware that something is missing so right. we we create that idol right mm-hmm. and that's essentially what's happening here if we you know put it in biblical terms right so um what were you going to say andrew earlier oh i was just thinking about the song look at your game girl right mm-hmm. like he when, when you're listening to that song it almost sounds like he's singing about the women right but I, what i'm thinking is that he was actually singing about himself yeah. And then mm. when he looked at the women, he looked at people who were a reflection of himself. He knew what he longed for. Exactly he it. knew what he wanted. So if he could find someone like that, he can give them everything that he desired. Right. But mm. what that is, what he truly desires is to manipulate. So 
to manipulate somebody without them really even realizing it. Of course, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. Right. They realize it way later on, but it's hopefully, actually hopefully yeah, yeah. realize it. That, yeah, some of them don't like Squeaky Fromm. She's right. still she's still under his spell, but he gets off like that. Right. That's exactly right. That so song's about himself. It is. So he like ultimately he wants to feel important. He wants to feel adored and revered and loved, and he can see that desire in the people that he like identifies for the family. So when he's even having sex with them, it, he gets off because he's. This is, sounds so intense, but he's having sex with himself. That's right. Yeah. No, no. I mean, which I mean, that's such a great way of really characterizing nar- narcissism. Mm. And Charlie is the ultimate narcissist. Wow. Um, so you know, it's 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 the it's a personality disorder that's mm. really really interesting and unique from all the other personality disorders because you it's characterized by this grandiose sense of self, this arrogance. But that's really just a defense mechanism for a an extremely mm. tiny self, it, like self worth, self image. Wow. Um, so, and we can see stuff in other people way easier than we right. see it in ourselves, right? Always. But so if if I know yeah. that I've really just I just want to be adored, admired, revered, and I can pick out people that are missing that, you know, feeling good about themselves in that way, mm-hmm. I can easily manipulate that. Twisted empathy. Yeah. That's right. So one of the things that we're talking about, this kind of sums up the, the relationship with a lot of the girls. Was there anything significant with any of the particular players you mentioned? You mentioned Susan Atkins. Um, <laughs> and she is one of the people that was involved in the murders. And she I, was. And I, and I mentioned to Diane Lake, for example, even though she wasn't. She, uh, like I said, it, she wrote a book kind of giving her own biography at the time of it. But um, were there any of the other people? Uh, oh, yeah, Tex Watson. Sure. Let's let's all, he was also a big part uh, because we're talking about the girls of Manson, but Tex got involved and he was a part of the murders at Cielo Drive. Well, he, I mean, he essentially led the murders at right. Cielo Drive. Um, you, and you see this in, in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. We're going to just reference this. It's so well done um, a lot. But he, uh, the girls were essentially told, do what Tex says. Mm. Okay, so and Tex was given the explicit orders, right? That like everybody in this house is going to die that night. Mm-hmm. Um, which again, just talking about Charlie's manipulation, how brilliant, uh, like really, truly sadistic and brilliant of him to send these people to do his dirty work. You know, in his mind, my hands are not bloody here, mm-hmm. right? So Susan Atkins was actually is, is believed to have been the one that wrote Pig. On the, on the wall in blood at the Cielo Drive house. Mm-hmm. Um, she was present for almost all of the murders. So not just the Cielo Drive, the, the, the Tate murders, but also the LaBianca yes. murders. And then the murder of Gary Hinman, which I don't, I don't know if we talked about that in the last episode, did we? We briefly mentioned it. Okay. But that was back in July 1969. Right. So this is prior to the Tate and LaBianca murders. Right. right. So he's really the first person they believe was murdered by the family. Mm-hmm. Um, and... Uh, and really death by association. Mm-hmm. Um, so then we have Tate, Tate murders, La Bianca murders, and then, um, let's see, there was one more at the end. Yeah. Donald Shea. So, um, and I think his body, both Hinman and Shea's bodies were found at Spawn Ranch, or at least on the surrounding property. Yeah. Um, maybe we should talk about Spawn Ranch a little bit. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk, yeah, okay. we'll jump into that in just a second. So, uh, Rook, so as far as do we know about Tex Watson was he also run away as well? I mean, he he seemed was he kind of one of the three hundred people? Or do you know how him and Manson met? Of all the things, I just know he just I mean, when I was reading the books too, it's all of a sudden you know you look at the family and really the involvement there, and all of a sudden you, Tex Watson is just is just kind of there and part of it. Yeah. Um. But so we can talk, talk about that. But like one of the things too, which uh, is an interesting aspect. Uh, and one of the things that interconnects the whole time from 1967 to 1969 is just the reality of music. Because mm-hmm. we talked about that he learned to, he learned to steal guitar in prison mm-hmm. uh, from a notorious gangster, which is still crazy and amazing. I know. Yeah. He, he, hears, really he hears initially he hears the Beatles in prison because he's not fully isolated from the outside world. No. And so that in the in same a, way that prisoners yeah. aren't isolated from the outside world, right. you know, in terms of media now. Right. right? So he's wanting to. To be famous, that's just the thing he wants. And but in order to pro- almost, because he always he's dealt with his whole life in many ways since childhood is, is rejection sure. and being worthless. So he's trying to find significance. So you know, and when, and when it comes to an aspiring musician, um, sorry, I'll let you jump in a yeah. second here. But I think like one thing is when you're 
anybody who's ever been, if anyone listens to our podcast, I, I work for a company uh, for six months that, and they listen to our podcast too, that uh, they're, they're an aspiring musician. And with that, and always trying to get a recording contract and you know, trying to play your gigs, trying to get those connection connections. There's a lot of trial and error. You have to go through rejection. Usually that's part of just the process in order to grow, in order to become famous. You look at any famous musician, they probably were ridiculed by all the critics and stuff like that, but they pushed forward. But I think for Charlie, there's so many underlying aspects. Mm -hmm. So, Well, and part of narcissism, part of what, what really defines narcissism or characterizes narcissism is the inability to withstand any kind of rejection or criticism. Right. No tolerance for it whatsoever. And that's connected to this underlying sense of absolute utter worthlessness. Mm-hmm. Um, I had an experience um, when I was doing my pre-doctoral internship at Arizona State Hospital, um, best experience of my life. <sighs> where I, we call it demasking. Um, so it was my first day, first day on um, the sexually violent predator unit there. And um, I ended up interacting with an individual who I knew nothing about. Mm-hmm. Um, turns out he was a sadistic serial rapist. Uh, his forte was um, using things like hot candle wax on his sedated or immobile geriatric victims in the nursing home he was working in really nice guy (laughs) Um, and it became really evident to me in the therapy session that we were in um, that he was attempting to switch therapists because he he thought that (laughs) that, uh, he could manipulate this new female therapist that had just been hired by the institution so I called him out on it um, in the group and if he could have killed me with his eyes in that moment he would have Um, so because I embarrassed him I called Mm. him out on his stuff in front of everybody and here I was this nobody student um, you know, there to observe. And, and, you know, I asked him, you know, Mr. So-and-so, isn't it true that you want to leave this 16 year veteran, you know, sex therapist veteran, um, and go to this newly licensed master's level female therapist because she'll be easy to manipulate. Mm -hmm. And if he could have killed me in that moment, he would have. And so I, we we refer to that as demasking and I inflicted what we call a narcissistic ego wound on this individual. Mm. Um, they cannot stand criticism. They just don't tolerate it. And that defined the relationship that I had with this individual for the next year. Um, and I always watched my back whenever I was on the so unit. In other words, so in other words, in regards to music, let's just say that Charlie Manson and Simon Cowell would not get along. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, except like, uh. unlike most of the people, you know, on American, mm. uh, he was American Idol, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, Charlie would have mm. felt nothing about taking out a gun and shooting Simon yes. <laughs> right there. Right. And so, so one of the things to is that you look at this not just culture revolution but a huge part of any uh, really revolution culture is always connected to music so we we mentioned there's people like Jefferson Airplane Frank Zappa and so you think about you think about all the music that took place in the Vietnam War like there's something happening here there's right that's as much as I'm going to sing here. but um, <laughs> yeah so you, but you have people like the Doors and right. you had all these like really well, famous the, bands the Beatles I mean right. they're all, it's, they, they're, it's a commentary of right. a, on what was happening in Vietnam right and even if you look at the involvement of the Beatles from when they first started versus you go to like some of their first very like happy songs hard, versus hard day's night. versus versus Sergeant Pepper where it starts to become you could start to really tell like right. Lucy in, Lucy in the sky so we're talking about you know psychedelics Lucy in the sky of diamonds like where do you get that right. so you happiness see happiness is a warm gun right yeah. ooh that's one of my favorite M- Beatles me too songs. <laughs> right oh I love that song <laughs> that so, so much, much. Yeah, we're gonna say, you know, well music during this time also changed so yes. prior to the 60s music was very folky very mm-hmm. storytelling but narrative narrative yeah during this time we actually had a shift of music to where it became a way to portray abstract concepts of metaphysical thought and emotion Mm -hmm. something that music had never really done prior at least within the modern history world so it was able now to disconnect disconnect from a material narrative sense of music and connect to something what would what would I would say like a movement or something greater mm-hmm. than the world, and so people right. could spiritually connect mm-hmm. with music during right. this time. Right. So one of the That's connections great. we're going to interconnect the story of Charlie and Dennis Wilson of the Beach Boys. So if you think from the cultural time that the Beach Boys really originally started, where it was just like very, it was kind of like a very happy aspect of California life. Everyone's gone surfing USA Mm -hmm. or I wish they could all be California girls. girls. Right. So you have this like very happy time. But with what was happening though is is that as 
the culture was becoming very revolutionary that they were the Beach Boys are really kind of really struggling to with their sound trying to find their audience because they were still have they still had that mindset of early to early, music from an early area where everyone would, would all wear the same suits and kind of the same outfit of conformity. They were behind the times. Yeah, they were yeah. they were behind the times. So it's, it's almost kind of like you know you look at those like washed up eighties bands trying to make a comeback. You oh, know, the hair metal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, right. So, so you kind of see that, but um, well, and so really, you were asking too about Tex Watson. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So Perfect. he so he he's a little bit different than some of the other than than the girls. Okay. okay? Okay. So he gr- grew up in a family that was intact. Uh-huh. Uh, he even attended a Methodist church Ooh. growing up. Um, he went to te- uh, college in, at the University of uh, North Texas and was a member of a fraternity there. Mm. Um, so he ended up getting connected to the Manson family through the women. Um, and so exploring the psychology of that, I think Tex Watson was more of a Manson understudy. Mm. So, you know, we've got the kind of the narcissism in bloom with him. Yes. Okay. Mm. So he was, I think he was more attracted to being idolized um, in the same way that Manson was um, and enjoyed the, the aspects of being the brainwasher and the manipulator mm-hmm. um, and less, even though he was absolutely manipulated yeah. by Manson, I think in his mind, he was more mm-hmm. like Manson than he was like the right. girls. Mm. So there were, I think there's a distinction there that we need, right. we need to make it. He was very smart. Mm. Um, and obviously still very influenced by Manson and one of the only men really to ever be a part of the family. Man- Char- Charlie did not want men in the family. Mm-hmm. Um, he wanted women. So, well, girls, yeah, girls and girls. So easier to manipulate. Right. right. And there's that aspect too that Charles Manson was a pimp in the past. Right. Mm-hmm. So he's getting a lot of girls to handle. Right. He's going to need someone that he can trust to handle them right. while he goes and does other things. Right. And Tex mm-hmm. Watson was that man. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And you'll and you'll see that, too, is that he only let people into his inner inner circle or inner clique that people he knew that he could control and manipulate. So one of the one of the people musicians he got connected with is Charlie's trying to find his way. And he and what ended up happening, too, is that as they're in San Francisco, Francisco, uh, they realize that the place where you want to really kind of make things happen as far as music goes is LA. So he works their way down with the girls and and they start really building their movement in, in Los Angeles. And so while they're there, they end up being connected with, he ends up uh, trying to formulate and, and he ends up getting connected with a musician named uh, Bobby uh, Bosley. And but one of the things that happens too is that even though they did some music together, he never let he told Charlie he's like I didn't allow you're not in my inner circle because you're too much of an independent thinker mm-hmm. and you're too much of an independent artist. Right. So we'll probably jump into this next episode because there's so many interesting things about Dennis uh, Wilson. So what we'll do is that I'm gonna just kind of tell the story about how they got connected which i i read about I'm like this is crazy know, really there's is. so many different things we're talking about things in prison i mean just this this story in and of itself so again in it, it's funny because in once upon a time in hollywood you know is that you know at the very beginning brad pitt's character is at a stoplight and he sees some of the girls conveniently who are coming out of a garbage dump looking for supplies which is one of the things that charlie Ari's always had him do which he also wrote a song called garbage dump <laughs> sing about it. <laughs> it wasn't the best song no but, yeah, but like he tried. <laughs> None of them hey, were that great, but, right? Yeah, but mm-hmm. um, yeah. So what ends up happening? So you see that scene where Brad Pitt sees all the Manson girls walking by. So what he was doing not only was he having the girls go and try and recruit uh, for his members, but they he to join the family. But he was also trying to help them find connections to build his musical career so he could become famous. So what ends up happening is that. The girls, these, uh, there's a couple of girls. I don't remember which ones were uh, out. It was just part of the family. And they're going around looking for connections to either recruit or connections for Charlie's uh, music career. And this guy pulls up in a, in a car, I believe it's a convertible right next to them, and says, hey, hey, do you want to come to my house for milk and cookies? And, of course, you would think that he is trying to offer some sort of, you know, favor uh, that would be uh, inappropriate, you know, obviously. But... So they go to his house expecting that for something more, but he literally comes out with a glass of milk and, some cookies. and a plate of cookies <laughs> and set it down for the girls. I'm sure they're like dumbfounded, like, what? He goes, yeah, here you go. And by the way, I got to go to a recording session. And go, oh, who do you, uh, like, so who's your recording? Like, who are you part of? Like, the Beach Boys, right? And so they're like, what? Right. Yeah, I'm Dennis Wilson. So 
that became the point when they went back to Charlie and, and said, oh, we just met Dennis Wilson from the Beast Boys. I can imagine how ecstatic he must have been. Like, this is my big break, right. you know, you're trying to do, it's kind of like, you know, you're in you're in Hollywood, you're doing all these movie auditions and stuff like that, and all of a sudden you get the, you get an audition for like Rocky or something like that. <laughs> right. I'm just trying to, I'm trying yeah. to think of a comparison. And well, you're this aspiring right, actor. Cary Grant walks into the audition room or somebody really famous and you're like, this is it, right? If I can make this connection, then this is the only door I need opened. Mm. This is basically equivalent to like Simon Cowell. It's like, congratulations, you're going to Hollywood. Yeah. <laughs> I've been stepping on these people for so long. Yeah. That now I've finally had my chance. Right. Gotcha. Uh, um, it, it really is just fascinating too and like to bring it back you know, like God's sovereignty in that right what? like I like God's sovereign over the details we catch and the details mm-hmm. we miss you know um, and so here here is this chance meeting right and it really sets the stage like in mm-hmm. Charlie's mind like you said Jerry this is it like mm-hmm. this is this is this is my ticket in right this is how I become like the Beatles right right um, which he wanted desperately to be right and just didn't come anywhere close um at least in a you know famous way right <clears throat> so i think we've covered a good portion of 1967 from 1969 and we're out to dennis wilson and we've gone at least an hour so we'll go what we'll do is we'll try and get the rest of <laughs> everything up until Ciela drive in the next episode so if you guys like this episode, let us know what you thought. I know this well, a lot of this material was difficult to listen to, so I believe we put a recording. Uh, just we'll, we'll put, we put a disclaimer at the beginning of all these. Obviously, this episode and the other ones. It, this is uh, mature content. It's difficult. Where this is a sinful world, and we need to talk about it because you don't have appreciation for the light unless you really show darkness in many particular ways so uh just like i said we do appreciate you all listening uh to this episode and as always this this program program cannot continue without your support uh we need you to help us help programs like this continue so uh be part of the cultist crew go to the cultist you can go to the donate tab please donate one time or monthly and help support us, allow this program to continue. There's so much we want to do to engage uh, the cultural, the culture, the world of the kingdom of the cults. Uh, we're, we are only uh, limited and held back by the support, and our, it's Andrew and I's goal to do this uh, full time so we can really expound not just upon the podcast, but do a whole lot more for you all. So again, go to thecultishow.com, go to the donate tab, donate one time or monthly. So all that being said, Robin, Thank you for mind hunting with us, <laughs> Doctor Mind Hunter. <laughs> Doctor Mind Hunter. It has been my pleasure. <laughs> and we will talk to you all in the the fourth segment of our true crime series. We are we are unraveling the mind of Manson. We're going to talk about Spawn Ranch, what happened there, Charlie's relationship with Dennis Wilson, and the music, and all the how that connected to what happened at Cielo Drive. So we will talk to you guys in the next episode. Thank you for listening.